What do most Fortune 500 executives have in common? After more than 150 conversations with executives from companies like Disney, Amazon, Netflix, and Google, I've learned that sports is a common denominator. Some of our guests' athletic experiences earned them a place in their sports hall of fame, like Chick-fil-A chairman Dan Cathy. Some hung up their cleats after high school, like Delta Airlines CEO Ed Bastian, while others, like Condoleezza Rice, claim they weren't that great in their sport. But no matter their skill level, they have all told me that being a part of a team taught them leadership lessons that they still use today. In partnership with Chief Executive Magazine, I'm your host, Don Yeager, here to give you an all-access pass to genuine, authentic, fireside chat-like conversations with today's business icons so that you can create powerful change in your organization. This is Corporate Competitor Podcast. With me for today's episode is Tim Story, renowned author and the ultimate comeback coach. Tim has impacted millions of people in 75 countries through his keynote speeches and his books. Whether he's working one-on-one -on -one with celebrities like Robert Downey Jr. and Kanye West, or sharing his wisdom on interviews like this one, Tim always inspires those around him. Growing up, Tim played baseball, football, tennis, and basketball, and I'm excited to learn from him today. As always, visit corporatecompetitorpodcast.com slash notes to find my favorite quotes from today's conversation and a thought-provoking reflection question to help you apply today's insights. Pay attention to the moving pieces. Life is like a diner. Someone's going to cook our food. Someone's taking our order. There's a host or hostess that sat us. You have to look at all the moving parts that take place before the waiter or waitress puts down the plate. And usually they say these words, enjoy. I would not be having this life. I get to enjoy if it wasn't for all the moving parts. Tim, thanks for joining us. What a privilege. You know, I loved learning your story. I was in an audience at John Maxwell's event in Orlando. I watched you pop onto the stage and just change the dynamic in a room. And so much pours back to your childhood. You embrace what you learned. Difficult as some of those moments were. Yeah. Grew up in Compton, California, seven people, small apartment. And you argued that that cramped life actually was an important journey for you. How does that kind of childhood shape someone who today shapes so many others? It's all about mindset. Even though we had, as you said, seven people in a two-bedroom apartment, my mother was so good when she said, we might be lower income, but we're not lower class. Mm. You never saw a bunch of dishes everywhere. You never saw the couches all messed up. The floors were always spotless. At the time, my mother worked at Winchell's Donut Shop, and my dad worked at Bethlehem Steel, and they were doing the best they could. Mm -hmm. The whole idea was to really prosper where you were planted with the right perspective. So I saw myself as blessed to have three older sisters, my brother Randy, three years older than me, to learn from them, to grow from them. I didn't really see the fact that I couldn't get Converse. I had something like it. I couldn't get Levi's. I had something like it. I was okay with the fact that I still had something. So perspective, you were gaining it early. Yes. Too many of us only remember the negative. But you had a sixth grade teacher, Mr. Prober. Yes. You know, we learned from education, conversation, and observation. This conversation with my sixth grade teacher, Mr. Probert, what it did for my life. My father had passed in a car accident. Mm. So I think that Mr. Probert had his eye out for me to see if I was going to be okay. One day he said, Timmy, can you stay after class? All the kids in school went, ooh. <laughs> so he said, I want to tell you something. I didn't know if he was going to say a good dancer because I had won the dance contest like a week earlier at the school. 
I didn't know if he was going to say, you're a good basketball player, because I noticed he liked to go to the games. He said, I think you are brilliant. Mm. This really came from his heart. And he said, I'm going to tell you why. Young man, you are just beyond. You are just extraordinary. Mm -hmm. He truly said this. He said, and because of that, I want to know if you would like to check out one of my books. This is not for extra credit. It's going to be like the library where you're going to have to sign for it. And I want you to turn it back into me in three weeks. So I chose a book by an amazing author named Irving Stone mm -hmm. about Michelangelo and how he saw life, how he saw stone, but he saw an angel coming out of the stone. Mm. He saw stone, but he saw faces coming out of the stone. <laughs> I went wild in sixth grade. <laughs> so Mr. Probert, he branded me brilliant, and I never took that label off. What a great lesson that is too for us as we grow we've got to reach back find those opportunities to offer some level of inspiration how have you repaid mr Probert? i tried to buy him a rolex watch but he refused it i like this guy more and more i have bought rolex watches for five of my mentors that mentored me from sixth grade up through college Every one of them tried to push it back. Mr. Probert would not let me do it because he said, you know, Timmy, I did it out of my heart. I saw something in you. My payment is watching who you become. Mm -hmm. I like to buy presents for people that they'll remember. But I also like to pay honor to them by speaking about them around the world. So I've been to 78 countries of the world, mm -hmm. speaking to 85,000 sometimes at a time telling the story, Mr. Probert. Wow. Let me go on. When you look at my life, to be mentored by Quincy Jones, Lee Iacocca, wow. Vidal Sassoon. This is not one talking session. This is 35 years of mentoring. And sometimes I'd meet with these guys twice a month, mm. just as their friend, who was at least 30 years younger than them as business leaders, it's easy to always look at this idea of we're on our grind, trying to scale, what's next, that we miss, as Eckhart Tolle says, the power of now. Mm. The power of now is to be fully present, fully feeling, and fully alive. One reason that life allowed me to be around such amazing mentors is because I am more looking for the quality in that person that I'm working with than what they can do for me. Not a way to get hired, to climb, to get something, but I saw them as incredible human beings and I was fully present, fully feeling, and fully alive. That's very needed by today's business person. You just hit on something that I'm fascinated by, the power of mentoring. You had relationships, but you understood the opportunity was to learn. Yes. A lot of the older guys enjoyed being around me because I honored them. Mm. I respected them. I listened to them. And I added value to them. Because they're not going to be around you just if you're a taker. I used to have great breakfasts with Larry King because... A restaurant you might be familiar with in Beverly Hills is Nate and Al's on Beverly Drive. Nate and Al's is like the spot. You look over there, there's Spielberg. You look over here, Monday through Friday, there's Larry King, buddy, when he was alive from 8 in the morning till about 10 in the morning with his guys. So Larry and I used to go at it all the time. He said to me one time, he goes, you know, the thing that's taking you to the top story. I said, what? He goes, you're a heck of a listener. Mm. And he said, the other thing is you're curious. When I'm talking, you're really curious. You're not thinking about what you're going to say next. Where did that curiousness come from? Part of it is innate. Part of it is learned. Mm -hmm. Curiosity is more innate. If I saw something incredible, I want to know like, What's the behind the scenes of that? Like, I remember the first time they took us to Disneyland at age seven and they did the fireworks. It wasn't enough 
for me to behold the fireworks. I was wondering, where do they come from? They're up there, but how did they get there? And later in life, I found out how they would then shoot these fireworks. But I was always interested in the behind the scenes. So the curiosity predominantly for Tim's story is innate. That's awesome. You know, as a young person, sports were important to you. Yes. You played baseball, football, basketball. You were on the varsity tennis team at Monta Vista High School, a Mustang. Yeah. Is there a moment from the courts and from that time in your high school years that you still think about occasionally? 100%. So being raised in the more of the inner city, we tended to go towards basketball and football. And an interesting thing happened to me as we began to move out of different areas of tougher parts of LA, I moved into a mixed school where you had different nationalities. I never wanted to be just in the pack. If I'm running the Boston Marathon and there's over 30,000 runners, I never run, want to run just in the pack. As a speaker on stages, I don't speak like anybody else. That is so true. I don't want to sound like them. I don't want to talk like them. I don't want their five points. That's why I did tennis, to jump out of the pack. And you did it well enough. I mean, make the varsity team captain? Yes. Do you still play today? Yes. Tennis, to some, it's a bougie sport. And I allowed the bougie of tennis to get me into some beautiful places. <laughs> This would be poor like pickleball, right? Right. This is quite common because when I was in my mid-20s, I was already life coaching famous people in Beverly Hills. Crazy. So they would say to me like, uh, I'd like to take you to the Beverly Hills Country Club. Uh, you don't play tennis, do you? Actually, I do. Tennis did a lot for my life. Yeah. Baseball, I was really, really good. I think I could have really gone far. As a shortstop, I had amazing range. My arm was a bullet. Back in those days, to hit over 300 was good, so I was constantly hitting over 300. Today, these kids are hitting 400, 500, which is shocking to me. But when I was still in a tough neighborhood, a kid was riding by on his bicycle. I was seven. He was 12, and he was like a phenom in the city. And he saw me throwing the ball with my neighbor, who was older, and I had it behind my ear, boom, and just boom, just throwing it, boom. He stopped his bike. He didn't know me. He goes, hey, what's your name? Timmy Story. Who, who taught you how to throw a ball like that? I said, I just watch other kids, or I go to the high school practices, and I watch the kids throw. And he goes, are your parents here? And I said, yes. Pulls his bicycle up to my driveway, knocks on my door, talks to my mother, and says, my name is David Gonzalez. I live not too far from here. Your son is extremely talented in baseball. I'm a very good baseball player. Would it be okay if I taught your son baseball? I give this kid respect for the way he did this because he was five years older than me. And she goes, I know who you are, and I know who your parents are. So it was okay. It was a neighborhood thing. Don, this guy was amazing at 12. He was like a Derek Jeter. What this guy trained me to do of keeping my glove down on the grass, not being afraid of anything. He had a fungal bat at 12. He'd throw it out and boom and bounce it off my chest. He'd go, come on, stay down, stay down, stay down. Man, the power of mentorship. We're only a few minutes into this conversation. We've already got a sixth grade teacher. Yes. David Gonzalez teaching you baseball. Some could look and go, gosh, boy, Timmy's story just was always in the right place. The truth is, Timmy's story was always in a place to learn. That's the thing that stands out to me. You know, we talk a lot about leaders needing to be lifelong learners. You're teaching me right now that if I can, even today, at my age, keep my eyes open, do the right thing, people will notice and you will get an opportunity to learn. Yeah. Well, thank you for observing that in me. You know, while we're talking about people who poured into you, you had a little league coach, Ron Trejo. Ooh. 
You were good. You pulled out wrong trail. That was good. <laughs> <laughs> he left an impact on you, especially regarding discipline. Wow. So now I'm a 10 year old in baseball. They're talking about me in our city, which is pretty good because you're in East LA. There's a lot of great athletes out of there. As a 10 year old, I get drafted to this guy's team, this Ron Trejo. Okay. He pulls me aside. He says, I see how good you are, but the thing I like the most is you keep your mouth shut. Keep that up. You're the youngest on the team because most of the kids were 12. Don't try to show people up. Don't brag. Don't talk too much. Stay the way you are. Man, he really like set me up for success on day one. And this guy, he was punctual. Everything was on time which I was used to because of my mother, getting down on the ball, not being afraid of anything. His brother played shortstop, phenomenal at short. So as a 10-year-old, he put me at third, the hot corner. And these big 12-year-olds just hitting shots at me. I was the human vacuum cleaner. So they would call me the Brown Brooks Robinson. <laughs> Brown Brooks Robinson. We are from the chocolate kid in Compton to the Brown Brooks Robinson. <laughs> they said... You could hit anything at that kid at third. Boom, boom, boom. The arm, boom. Ron Trejo, man. He taught me how to be disciplined at the plate. To go ahead and take the first strike. Because I didn't like to take the first strike. I thought that put me behind. No, no, no. He goes, I need you to see what these older pitchers got. Make them prove they can get it to you. Yeah, bring it. Oh, man, he taught me discipline, discipline. Discipline. But here's a beautiful thing about life. Later in life, he struggles. Mm. And I become Tim Story. My life becomes pretty well known. And in the midst of a big setback he had in life, he searched me out. He said, Tim, I'm in trouble. With my life, with my family, it's not easy for me to go to anybody, but I might need your help. Mm. I walked him through life for the rest of his life. What a great story. It is awesome that so many of these folks, you've been able to keep not just their story alive, but their memory alive by the relationships you've been able to maintain with others. That's a gift in its own right. Yeah, thank you. I, I stick with them all, every one of them. You know, Iacocca helped me all the way to his final days on earth with Quincy Jones I continue to stay close to him, Barry Gordy, all the guys that have helped me all these years, honoring Vidal by being around his kids. I love his kids anyway. You got to give honor back. So coach me. There have been people who have been good to me in my life. What's something that you would say, Don? Here's how to think about those relationships and here's how to honor them. Yeah. One can go into a diner and just sit down with a friend. Let's say we're at Nate and Al's in Beverly Hills. But we're not understanding that somebody put their money up to put that diner on Beverly Drive in Beverly Hills. Someone's going to cook our food. Someone's taking our order. There's a host or hostess that sat us. So life is like a diner. Mm. You have to look at all the moving parts that take place before the waiter or waitress puts down the plate, and usually they say these words, enjoy. I would not be having this life. I get to enjoy if it wasn't for all the moving parts. Mm. I pay attention to the moving pieces. Whenever you see me speak, you will see me stand up and say, I want to thank the sound men or sound women. I want to thank people on the cameras. I want to thank all the workers. We have over 100 and so-and-so workers working this today. I'm always behind the scenes talking to the workers. It's the speaker who gets up like, I'm in my zone, and I can only take so many pictures because I'm in my zone. <laughs> Not me, buddy. I'm talking to the guy putting the cords together. <laughs> this is a big lesson for all of us. This is about intentionality. Yes. I'm, in, I'm intentional. The reality is I'm having some moments in life that are nice. Mm -hmm. But you know this more than me. 
there's another side of this where we see a Bill Walton. Mm. Never got a chance to meet him, but I know you had to be around him. Loved him. And now he's not on the planet. Mm. You look over your left shoulder, there I see John Wooden. Yep. I mean, come on. It's John Wooden. So life gives us these seasons. Mm -hmm. So this season that I'm in and the season that you are in, wow, what a privilege. Thank you, sound man, for letting me sound good. Mm. Thank you, people. What? I got to take 575 pictures today? Thank you, 575 people, for even wanting to take a picture with me. I love that. So you've written eight books. And when you released Come Back and Beyond, you went on Oprah's podcast, had a chance to listen to it. And she said that you made her believe that, quote, no matter what we're facing, we're all capable of turning any setback into a comeback, any setback into a comeback. Yeah. So I studied this subject for 33 years, not in a small way. When you have a setback, it's usually a life interruption. A comeback is not a go back. So let's say you got fired from a job and you've been there a long time. And now you think, I got to get that feeling back. Mm. I got to show these people they made a mistake or I got a divorce. I got to somehow go back and fix it. A comeback is not a go back. What happened? That happened. So now what do we do? Mm -hmm. Number one, you have to become awake, conscious, like, okay, they just let me go at this job. Secondly, you have to take inventory. Where's my mindset? Mindset is your clarity of your mind and the strength of your mind. Where am I at physically? Am I breathing? Am I okay? Am I obese? Am I too skinny? Third, partner with the right people. Mm -hmm. This is where most people miss it. When they're in a setback, most people go singular, and that's the time to go plural. Mm. You do not need to be singular in a setback. You need to go plural. You need us. This is the time to go plural. Love it. And now fourth. So you have your awake, inventory, partners. Fourth one is the principles. And that's the guy to your left behind you, John Wood. Mm -hmm. The principles of how do I get myself through honor, integrity, character, hard work, discipline, courage, faith. I can yank anybody out of a situation. Mm. And I've yanked out a lot of your friends. <laughs> With four parts. I love it. Comeback is not a go back. I will be using that, I'm sure. Well, I hope not too often, but you know, the truth is these moments occur for each and every one of us. And it's our awareness and our knowledge that can be really important. You know, you also talk about the difference between a discovery zone and a recovery zone. Yeah, we're all in that state now. So we're all in recovery and discovery at all times. Wow. Recovery is a mending, a healing, a restoration. Some of my wealthy friends will say to me, I just did this test. Have you done that one test where they put you in the tube and they could see everything you got, everything at one time? And what they all come back with is there were some things that were wrong. Mm -hmm. Same thing in our lives. There's so many moving pieces. There's your job, your finances, single, married, kids, mindset. So we're all in the recovery zone of things past in things present. But if you're not careful, you get so caught up in the recovery zone, you'll miss your discovery zone. Ooh. When Don was a kid, did they call you Donnie, Donald? They call me Donnie because my father's name is also Don. Yes. Okay. So I was Timmy, you were Don. Donnie spent most of his time in the discovery zone. Who's out today? We're riding bicycles, we're getting ice cream, we're trading baseball cards. When we're kids, we wake up looking for stuff to discover. That's magic. Yeah. Magic. Most people, they're missing the magic because they're so caught up in the recovery zone. Mm -hmm. They're missing the discovery zone. 
where the good stuff happens. Yeah, and the discovery zone is the unfolding. When we were kids, we didn't have access to this. The phone. When I go into my mother's house, who's now 93 and still healthy, I leave this in my car because that's my 93-year-old mother, and she raised me. So I go into the discovery zone with my mom, and we laugh, and we joke about when she was a kid, and we talk about different things and experiences. And even today, I went to the gym, but also went for a walk. I stayed off my phone. I did not listen to a book on tape. Mm -hmm. I did not listen to motivational mantras. I just walked and I was breathing. And you hear birds. You see a son walking with his dad. You see interesting things around you. That's the discovery zone. Mm -hmm. I intentionally make time just to pay attention. Well, you are a man of intention. You know, I think in the corporate world, the world that you get a chance to counsel and coach, one of the most overused words is the word team. We talk about me and my team. The truth is most of us don't work with a team. We work with a bunch of individuals who all happen to draw the same paycheck. But you've been on teams. You know what it means to create teams. If you were to coach me on how to take a group of disparate individuals and shepherd them, guide them to a team, what would be one of the first two or three things you'd counsel me to be thinking of as I'm building a team? Alignment to an assignment. Mm. What is a realistic assignment for this year for this team? Is it to make the playoffs? Is it to go deep into the playoffs? Or is it realistic that we could actually win the championship? Because I like to deal in realities, even though I'm a dreamer. Yeah. So when I'm forming a team, I'm looking for alignment to the assignment. The second thing I'm looking for is a growth mindset rather than a fixed mindset. This is the teaching of Carol Dweck out of Stanford University. Yep. There's three levels of living, almost, most, and utmost. A team of second tier players who have not hit the utmost status that are real team players who have a growth mindset. Right. As a team, as we form, with a growth mindset, we can learn and grow on a weekly basis. Whether we win or lose and win and win and win and lose and win and lose, we can grow from all those experiences. Mm -hmm. The last thing I'm looking for is I'm looking for diversity. Mm. I want a funny guy. I want a serious guy. I want a guy in the middle. I want a guy who needs an interpreter and one who does not need an interpreter. <laughs> I want diversity in allowing ourselves to be original and unique has been one of the secret sauces of some of the greatest teams that you have been so gloriously writing about for so many years. You hit that one on the head. That's for sure. Tim, I watched you on a stage. I was riveted by you today. I'm better. I'm better because I got time with you. I appreciate you so much. Thank you. And I love our friendship. I look forward to doing projects with you and us finding ways to help people, strengthen people, build people. Thank you for the privilege of letting me be on your podcast today. Wow. <laughs> I just got coached by a man who coaches the very best in the world. Pretty amazing. And I hope you felt like you got coached as well. But what I love about Tim's story is this is a guy who completely appreciates that he is the product of all of these relationships and the people who have poured into him. I loved his analogy. Life is a diner. It's kind of funny because he talked about Nate Niles, a diner there in Hollywood. I actually just had breakfast there with my wife and Steve Bosco, who was a previous podcast guest when we were in Los Angeles for a speaking event. But too often, we sit down to wait for the plate and for the waiter or waitress to say, enjoy. But the truth is, a lot of moving parts had to incur in order for that moment of enjoy to arrive on your table. And you have to enjoy and be aware of and grateful for all those moving parts in your life that really shines 
in Tim Story's lessons that he teaches. The second great takeaway I had was the need to seek mentoring. He made sure that in all of these incredible relationships that have been afforded him both through being hired and also through just opportunity is that he was looking to learn something from these people that he had access to. He was a great listener and he was always inquisitive, always curious. Those two habits back to back make a life's worth of difference. And then finally, the third one that really caught my attention was when he got into the idea that a comeback is not a go back. If something happens, you're suddenly taken off of the track that you thought you were on. It's not a go back. Four steps. The first was become awake. Understand you have to come alive in these moments. Doesn't matter how difficult the, the moment might be. Secondly, take inventory of your mindset, of your physical conditioning. Take inventory of where you are. Third, partner with the right people. Love this one, especially when you said the words, many people go singular. No, this is the time to go plural. Really love that. And fourth, he said, make sure you're attacking this comeback with deeply rooted principles. Be aware of the principles that are going to be reflected in who you are forever because they will show in that moment. Tim Story fired me up. I loved him when I watched him on a stage. I loved it even more to get this time with him and to bring his lessons to you. I hope today you feel as if you are a greater corporate competitor. If you enjoyed this episode, please leave us a rating and review on Apple and Spotify. Feedback helps us spread the insights of our guests to a wider audience. It actually increases our ratings. Thank you so much for those who have done so in the past. And catch new episodes every Wednesday. Subscribe at corporatecompetitorpodcast.com to be the first to get a chance to listen. And as a thank you gift, I will send you a chapter from one of my best-selling books. Stay connected with me on LinkedIn, Facebook, Instagram, Twitter. My handle is at Don Yeager, D-O-N-Y-A-E-G-E-R. And until next week, I appreciate you.